next month, Proposition E uh, will be on the June ballot, and it'll ask San Franciscans to either uphold or reject. It's not easy to do this. It's not easy to figure this out. Yeah, right? but I mean, I don't, I don't feel like just because something is sweet means that it's only targeted towards young people. I mean, people want things that taste nice, and if you're going to smoke it, they do. They, they want that, you know? Yeah, I, well, I get that part. Uh, and, and to me, though, the real the real question here is, will, will a, does a ban serve the people uh, uh, as opposed to whatever uh, whatever else we're trying to get you know out of this thing? Right. I mean, if that's what we're talking about, what is the purpose of a ban? A ban is it's it's to serve the people. I right, well, let's so we're joined right now by a, uh, a smarter guy than me. Uh, and this this is uh, uh, Professor David Sweener from the University of Ottawa. Uh, David, thanks for taking the time to join us here and uh, crossing uh, countries. Um, so you hear this story that uh, San Francisco residents, some are outraged over this, some are supportive. Uh, this is going to it's going to hit the ballot in June. What's your take on something like this? Uh, is you think it will be successful? Well, uh, we'll see what happens with the vote. I think from a public health standpoint, uh, it would be very nice to see it divided uh, uh, to look at different products. I mean, the reality here is that you know, what what kills people is the smoke. It isn't it isn't the nicotine. It isn't even the tobacco. It's the smoke. And you know, Scott Gottlieb, the commissioner of the FDA, has uh, has been insistent that we need to move people down what he calls the continuum of risk. You know, cigarettes are in the range of about a hundred times more hazardous than many of the things available that are non combustion products. So I think that it makes sense to have flavors in the low risk products. If that's a door to smokers leaving cigarettes, mm-hmm. if that's what they're looking for, and it clearly works, you know, an awful lot of uh, smokers not only don't want to smoke cigarettes, they don't like the taste, they don't like the smell, they can move away from that through things like vape or uh, uh, oral forms of, of tobacco, uh, things like snus or uh, moist snuff. But if, if you decide that what you want to do is, is go after the entire category, you're really protecting cigarettes because it in, instead of... I, of th- this being something that opens the door to people using cigarettes, this is something that closes the door to people who want to get off cigarettes. I think we should actually be giving more choices for people to get off cigarettes and do things to beat up on cigarettes. So I would certainly support the idea of dealing with flavored cigarettes, uh, anything that would be enticing for cigarettes. But let's keep in mind, you know, half a million Americans are dying every year from cigarette smoking. Well, this, in- and yeah, smoking. and this includes the fl- menthol cigarettes, this ban. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm not too fussed. I mean, other than the fact that people can mentholate their own cigarettes and uh, you have to worry about uh, contraband, et cetera. But uh, I, I like the idea of doing things that that push people along that continuum of risk, just like many uh, many jurisdictions used higher taxes on leaded gasoline than unleaded as a way to move people uh, to the unleaded gasoline years ago. Well, th- we should th- be th- doing the same thing here. We should have different levels of, uh, of, of marketing, of taxation, et cetera, based on relative risk. If we well, could reduce and, the risk for people who are currently smoking cigarettes by moving them to non-combustion products, that would just be a huge benefit to public health. Yeah, this is kind of similar to a story we did earlier about handing needles out in the city. The city, we have some problems here. They, they, they find 275,000 needles a year on the streets of San Francisco. It's a lot of needles. Uh, a well, lot of- if you look at it in terms of automobiles, I mean, what we've done to uh, to try to reduce the risk of automobiles, what we did an alcohol policy to try to reduce the, the risk of alcohol, what we do with sexual education. I mean, we recognize people will do things that have risks. What can we do in public health to reduce those risks? Yeah. And if we take an, an absolutist, abstinence-only view that, you know, we're just going to try to discourage people from using any sort of tobacco or nicotine product, when the vast majority are currently using by far and away the deadliest product, we end up protecting that deadly product. Yeah, you know, I, I go back to, I, I think it was Freud that said sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Uh, I would like to f- try to figure out, though, without getting too Freudian, uh, why people smoke, uh, why people uh, drink to excess, uh, why we use uh, uh, drugs. And, and, and again, you know, the, not trying to be big brother, but trying to help people instead of just trying to social engineer solutions? You know what I mean? Sure. No, I, I think there's a lot of good uh, information on this as well. That I mean, people use drugs for reasons. Uh, in, in fact, you know, as, as a, a species, we do seek to alter our consciousness, whether it's using a drug or watching a sunset or looking at art or... or listening you know, to the show. You know, I, I hear uh, you. Yeah. You know, and, <laughs> 
some people are seeking to do that to seek oblivion. Some people are seeking to do that to uh, uh, sort of self-regulate, uh, you know, deal with uh, mm. attention deficit issues. Or, yeah, did you ever, uh, do you remember those, uh, David, do you remember those uh, Levi's commercials that were all psychedelic for a long time back in the 70s? Uh, they, they, it was the first use of, uh, of kind of this sort of, um, uh, you know, computer-generated images. And I remember hearing Timothy Leary saying, if they had these commercials around in the 60s, I wouldn't have done acid. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I think there's. Well, I, mean, I, I think the, the thing in, in public health is that you know it isn't it isn't for us to judge what people are doing. It, uh, it it's about reducing the risk for what they are doing, and keep them alive. Keep them alive long enough to intervene. So if somebody's sticking a needle in their arm. If you can give them a clean needle, you can keep them alive long enough to try to deal with the underlying problem. If somebody's smoking cigarettes, keep them alive. Give them their nicotine in another way that's it's virtually innocuous. Uh, that's then you can deal with the nicotine. And as, as we've heard, like in studio, this is really common. Things like vaping it appears to be far less addictive than uh, than cigarette smoking. You have far more control over the nicotine. So an awful lot of people move to vaping. They move to flavored types of vaping or flavored types of smokeless tobacco, and then they get totally out of the market. You know, it's a stepping stone for them. I think we need to encourage that sort of thing. But I think we we really do need to inform consumers that there are these huge differences in risk, the way Dr. Gottlieb has, has been saying. And to the extent you can reduce your risk, that's fantastic. So, to the extent you can eliminate yeah. your risk, I mean, phenomenal. But at the very least, if you can reduce your risk by you know, 95 or more percent by switching to vaping uh, rather than smoking cigarettes, we should be encouraging that and not put any roadblocks. So I, got, I should get over my... Uh, my, my um my pain that uh, R.J. Reynolds supports uh, is against this ban because I hate everything that is R.J. Reynolds and, and well, what they you, do. If you look at the stuff that's really hurting big tobacco right now in the United States, it's these alternative products. It's things like vaping. Uh, the vape shops are not owned by big tobacco. The, uh, uh, the vast majority of that market, if you look at it on a unit basis, you know, the, uh, the equivalent of, of a cigarette, big tobacco has somewhere in the range of 10 to 15 percent of the vaping market. They're getting blown away by the likes of Juul, by the vape shops, by innovative technology. I mean, these guys are sitting ducks for for innovation. Do you know why they haven't jumped on the new technology and created? I mean, they're they're trying. The the problem is they're just so uh, behind the eight ball. Yeah, if you look any at any new technology, what's the chance of big? conservative, risk-averse, lawyer-dominated companies doing well when you get disruptive technology. Well, you know, when you put it that away. way. <laughs> <laughs> well, and but you're right, the record the companies were the same way when uh, digital yeah. media came along. And they're also, and they're busy, they're busy selling billions of cigarettes a day in Asia. So let's be honest, right? Yeah, so they're, they're doing well. I mean, I mean the, the, the way that cigarette companies do so well is they're essentially a cartel. They, they've got a control of a, a, a near monopoly on the delivery of a widely used dependence-producing substance. That's, that can be solved by regulation to say, let's open this market so they can't have this little cartel of two or three companies controlling the market, keep raising their prices, make an absolute mint. I mean, it's uh, an incredibly lucrative business selling cigarettes. Well, David, uh, is, even though it's technically impossible, we're out of time. But uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, uh, great stuff. I believe we, you and I have spoken before because your, your smartness is resonating in my head. <laughs> we have indeed, and I enjoy it every uh, time. David, thank you so much, my Thanks friend. A million. Uh, all right. Uh, this Good is. Chatting with I you. see you, buddy. Uh, Professor David Sweener from the University of Ottawa. I, you know, he has kind of uh, changed. I, I, uh, part of, I, I, I'll be honest with you. It's, uh, he has kind of changed my opinion. I don't know if he's changed my vote. Uh, we'll talk. <laughs> <laughs> he explains the issue so he does. He well, does. and you're like, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater.